So the Smithsonian has had a long history of, of interest, not only in the high seas, but the ocean in general. And I think those of us who know us by because you're here in Washington, I'm sure many of you have been to the Sand Ocean Hall. Uh, you just had a chance to walk through Curious, which has lots of really cool marine organisms in its uh, on display and in the various drawers. And we also run from here. I help lead the Ocean Portal uh, uh, website uh, designed to educate people from around the world about the ocean. So there's a lot of things that we do here at the Smithsonian, but there's uh, that are very conspicuous to you all, uh, as this event is, of course. But we also do some things that are behind the scenes. Uh, we have millions and millions and millions and millions of specimens of marine organisms, not only here in this museum hiding away in drawers, but also at an off-site facility in Suitland, Maryland, where all the stuff that's uh, kept in alcohol uh, is, uh, is uh, available for researchers around the world. Uh, and we also uh, have a number of research programs that take us everywhere, literally. So there's a marine geo program, which is a global network of coordinated observations and experiments. There's the DROP program, uh, which has actually got a lot of news recently because it discovered a whole new ocean deep water zone off the coast of Curacao. It specializes in reefs that are uh, too deep to dive to. Uh, we have a very important Healthy Reefs, Healthy People conservation program uh, focused on the Belize Barrier Reef. Oops. A program called Ocean Optimism, it started off as a Twitter campaign, which has since uh, reached over a, a hundred million Twitter accounts and has now morphed into hashtag Earth Optimism. I encourage you to all look at those programs as well because they're all about telling not just the story of doom and gloom, which we of course all aware of, but also the story of success. And then finally, we do a lot of basic biodiversity research, including uh, uh, starting now well over a decade ago associated with the census of marine life which Barb might mention we were that's I think how I first got to know Barb well as we were partners in that effort so the Smithsonian is completely dedicated to understanding the ocean and help protect it and restore it and so that's why it's such a pleasure to be able to uh, today uh, welcome the co-chair of the Aspen High Seas Initiative uh, and uh, he is as I mentioned a friend uh, David Shaw he's a very uh, successful business person and also a world leader in philanthropy for the ocean with major programs in national parks and ocean conservation. He's also uh, my neighbor in Maine, uh, which is a fun as well. So without any more words, I'd like to introduce David to start the program. Thank you, Nancy. This is a nice reunion. And thank you to the, uh, to, the, to the Smithsonian Institute for a st strong commitment to ocean education. Uh, my last opportunity to be here was, in fact, at the Earth Optimism Summit, a beautiful event uh, hosted by the Smithsonian uh, two years ago on Earth Day. So I was pleased to present at that. But uh, we thank you for co-hosting this event with the Aspen Institute. Let me also extend thanks to the Schmidt Ocean Institute for being a partner in this event. Uh, to my co-chair and awesome dive buddy, Dr. Sylvia Earle. <laughs> uh, thanks to our many colleagues in the ocean stewardship community and all, also to all of the uh, students here today that represent the future of, of uh, this important work. So on behalf of the uh, uh, Aspen High Seas Initiative, I want to welcome, welcome you to this, this briefing. We have a remarkable opportunity today <clears throat> to meet a, a team of leading scientists on a first ever research expedition to one of the planet's uh, least explored, largest unexplored habitats. They've, they've named this remote uh, Pacific habitat, which is the size of Colorado, the White Shark Cafe. And this is a marine area. Uh, it's one of a number of areas that the High Seas Initiative has targeted for full protection. So speak, speaking more broadly, though, beyond what you're going to hear uh, from the, the White Shark Cafe, we've established this initiative, the, the Aspen High Seas Initiative, uh, to uh, bring public attention and action to the world's largest conservation frontier, the high seas. So high seas are largely unregulated areas beyond national jurisdiction. They cover the majority of the, uh, of the ocean surface and they represent the best opportunity, we think, to protect, restore, and maintain the health of world oceans. 
Uh, as many of you know, the, the, the oceans are, are critical to life on Earth. Uh, they provide most of the oxygen that we breathe, the, the fresh water that we drink, and have a huge impact on our, on our weather and our climate. By protecting high seas, uh, at least 120 maritime nations, and, and, and maybe we should say nearly the 200 uh, nations on Earth are expected to experience net gains of some kind, including fisheries, and mankind is the greatest beneficiary of, of the health of these oceans. So since our initial launch uh, at the Aspen Ideas Fest last summer, we've moved forward on several areas. The identif identification of 16 marine areas that are biologically important and, and deserve to be protected. We've started production of two films, National Geographic Sea of Hope and a forthcoming film on, on the high seas. Uh, we've invested in technology solutions for exploration and enforcement of marine reserves. And enforcement, it's not enough to, to, to to uh, call an area protected, enforcement is critical. We've created an ocean core for national service for 18 to 28 year olds. We've begun planning an ocean X curriculum to educate and engage the next generation. And we, w one of our first actions in this effort was to successfully advocate for the creation of the United Nations Special Envoy for Oceans. This is a critical position for ocean stewardship and it's, and it's been filled by a great ocean advocate, Peter Thompson, and, and we're working very closely with him and help, have helped fund that office. So I want to thank uh, supporters of these efforts, uh, key, of, of various components of our initiative, the Aspen Institute, the, Smith, the Schmidt Family Foundation, Emerson Collective, Roger and Vicki Sant, uh, Linda Cabot, uh, and the and the BOSEED Ocean Awareness Programs, Kim Wentworth, Daniel Moss, uh, Joanna Ossinger, and many others. So this is the early days of this venture and we really appreciate the, the support from, from these sources. Uh, also to advi advise this important initiative, uh, we've assembled an experienced group of ocean experts, former government, top officials, business and nonprofit leaders, researchers uh, and, and business leaders uh, youth ambassadors who bring innovative solutions and, and help us think broadly about such a critically important effort. So today I'm excited to announce and introduce the new leader of the effort that I've just described, Mike Conathan. Welcome, Mike. <laughs> yesterday, yesterday was Mike's first day on the job, so we're putting him right to work here. <laughs> Uh, on today's exciting program. Uh, Mike previously served as the Director of Ocean Policy for the Center uh, for American Progress and spent five years on the staff of the U.S. Uh, Senate uh, Subcommittee on Oceans, Atmosphere, Fisheries, and Coast Guard. So he has both the right experience and, and expertise to uh, across political spectrums to, to lead this effort. So please join me in, in welcoming, welcoming Mike. This is a, a, a critical t time to uh, put some leadership behind this, this great venture and we're, we're very happy to have you, Mike. All right, well thank you, David, thank you. and uh, thank you to the rest of, of the audience who's assembled here today for this exciting program. Many thanks to Sylvia uh, and uh, I, I really I have to start um, by thanking uh, John Bridgeland and Bob and Sarah Nixon as well for being able to put this uh, this whole event together um, really on their own in the absence of uh, uh, um, uh, infrastructure and at least the absence of an executive director um, because I could not have pulled this together in the last 36 hours, I'm pretty sure. Um, so thank you for doing that. We wouldn't be here without you guys and I want to make sure that your hard work to make today possible is acknowledged as well. Um, and most especially thanks to David and to Sylvia for agreeing to uh, co-chair this uh, really critical initiative. Um, but I would, I, I don't want, we've had plenty of introduction. I, I would like to take this opportunity to really just launch into this exciting conversation that we're going to have today. Um, David and others have alluded, we are here to talk about the White Shark Cafe, um, which I kind of, I, 
kind of had this vision of like the Gary Larson Far Side cartoon of all these guys like sitting around with their little pinkies out, you know, having their little their little cappuccinos. But um, really, that's about as much as we know about it. Is that that's probably not what's taking place there. But other than that, we don't know much about what actually is taking place there. Uh, and this is going to be the first report that we've ever had from this area, uh, remote area of the high seas, uh, about 1,300 miles off the coast of of North America. Um, this is a place that that the scientists among them, some of the scientists who will be with us here today, um, really only discovered over the course of the past decade when technology advanced to the point where they could put tags on their research partners, on these, uh, these incredibly charismatic macrofauna of the deep ocean, the great white sharks, uh, and track where they went when they left the coast of North America, when they left California and Baja and other areas of Mexico. Um, we all knew that they disappeared in the spring, but nobody knew where they went. And now we do know that they congregate in this area, which, yes, it's the size of Colorado, and that sounds big. But when you think about it in the context of what's out there in the ocean, um, it's a really small part. It's a postage stamp of what's out there. Uh, and so the fact that all of these sharks swim this far and go to this place, and still no one knows why, because our ocean exploration uh, efforts have, have fallen short of where they need to be, uh, well, that's a, a huge mystery, and that's what we're here to, to talk about today. And you're going to hear the, the first reports from this area, from this research cruise that's out there on site right now. Um, and so to do that, obviously, we're incredibly fortunate to have these uh, leading ocean experts um, here in the room, in person named Sylvia and others, and of course, um, on the screen, as we'll see um, throughout the afternoon. Um, I just want to briefly introduce the folks who you've seen their images up here um, to, to kick things off, and, and we'll be hearing from each of them individually as we go through. Um, joining us remotely, uh, and actually, as you heard, sort of from Paris to, uh, to Palo Alto to the Central Pacific Ocean, um, we've got uh, really half of the globe covered, the entire half of the globe that is currently in light. We've got somebody there um, to report back on this amazing issue. We've got. Uh, Dr. Francesco Freddi, uh, who is in Palo Alto with Stanford University. We have Dr. Fanny Duvier uh, from Paris, who you can see waving from the little uh, vignette over there. Uh, and of course, Dr. Barbara Block uh, from the research vessel Falcor um, out on site. Uh, and we will be reserving some time at the end for questions from you. So as, as you're hearing these things, as questions come up, take note. Um, I'm going to call on you towards the end of the program to engage directly with these folks. And we really want to hear from you, the audience, particularly the students in the room. Um, you guys are the future of what we're building here and of what we know we're going to need to be working on for um, generations to come as we talk about the high seas. Um, oh, and if, if for those of us who are following online, those of you who are following online or here in the room uh, and want to tweet about what you're hearing today, we encourage you to do that. And uh, do so, please, using the hashtag White Shark Voyage uh, is the hashtag we're using for this event today and for the voyage itself. You may have seen uh, some of the reports from, from on site over the last uh, several weeks as they've been out there um, gathering the data that we're going to hear about today. Uh, so I think that's all my nuts and bolts. Oh, other than to say, if you are going to tweet, uh, make sure your cell phones are on silent, please. Uh, we don't want those uh, interruptions as we're, we're on this uh, critical <coughs> uplink. So um, we're going to pass it off now. I'm going to pass it off to uh, someone who I am incredibly proud to call uh, a friend and now a colleague, um, the inimitable, remarkable, her deepness, Dr. Sylvia Earle. Uh, Dr. Earle, yes, please. Um, Dr. Earl is the co-chair, as you heard, of the Aspen High Seas Initiative. Uh, she's a National Geographic Explorer in residence uh, and a lifetime Aspen Institute trustee. She was recently, as you may have noted, on the cover of Time Magazine as one of the women who are changing the world, in her case, very much for good. Uh, and she also won the TED Prize in 2009 with a big idea that gave rise to our um, Aspen High Seas Initiative. So we're incredibly grateful to have her. Uh, and before um, I hand the mic over to her, we're actually going to start with a quick video clip from uh, the documentary that you've heard uh, much about so far this afternoon, Sea of Hope. So, She's spent thousands of hours underwater. Scientist, explorer, and conservationist, Dr. Sylvia Earle. Change is happening fast. We're losing coral reefs. We're losing fish in the ocean, and whole ecosystems are coming apart, unraveling. The chemistry of the planet is being affected by what we're putting into the ocean or taking out of the ocean. It's a different world. All life, including humankind, needs the ocean. 
The ocean now needs us. Great. So fortunately, Sylvia, the ocean has you and the ocean has the rest of us. Um, and as we start to kind of launch into our topic here in our conversation, um, give us the overview. Give us, talk about our understanding. What, is, what are the high seas and why are they so important? So the stage is yours. So those of you who are watching, if you want to see this live stream, it's available on the Mission Blue website. And to note that the White Shark Cafe has been designated and endorsed by the International Union for the Conservation of Nature as a hope spot, one of the nearly 100 places in the ocean globally that Mission Blue supports with a goal of trying to build really a network of, of hope for this little blue speck in the universe that we call home. Okay, so why the White Shark Cafe? Why the high seas? Why now? Well, it would be better if we'd started 100 years ago, or 50 years ago, or even 30 years ago. <laughs> Some of us gathered here at the Smithsonian actually talking about the diversity of life on Earth, and there are only two and a half individuals talking about the marine side of the diversity of life on Earth at that big conference. Well, since then, the census of marine life has come about. Now we know that most of life on Earth lives in the ocean, lives in the dark, lives below where light penetrates. It's the largest living space on the planet, and it is at risk because why? Look in the mirror because of what we are doing, what we're putting into the ocean, what we're taking out of the ocean. But the biggest threat is what we do not know about the ocean or why it matters to every breath we take, every drop of water we drink, every dollar we spend, every bite of food we take, every bit of history we care about. The ocean makes Earth a functional living planet where we can be prosperous, where we can exist. And if you think about the alternatives, and some people were thinking very seriously about skipping out, going to Mars, or where are those places elsewhere in the universe where when we use up this planet, we can go take up residence somewhere else. But the fact is, the best chance we will ever have for a long and enduring future is right here, where we have an ocean that does still function. We can still breathe. Water does still magically fall out of the sky. We don't have to go around with scuba tanks on our backs. We don't have to go as if we lived on Mars, where we have to be conscious of our life support system, with just as astronauts do when they go high in the sky just as I do when I go deep in the ocean. Life support, life support, life support. What makes Earth function? Well, all living things play a part. And of course, we are a part of all living things. But we don't live apart from the rest. We're totally dependent on those fine-tuned me mechanisms that have taken hundreds of millions of years to reach the point where we have 20% roughly oxygen in the atmosphere, 79% nitrogen, and about 1% of a mix of things, including just enough carbon dioxide to power photosynthesis, capture carbon, generate food, release oxygen into the atmosphere, shape a planet that works in our favor. All right, so if we could just go back 50 years, or sooner if we could, armed with what we now know, what might we do to protect the systems that keep us alive now that we know that it really matters? We have spent all of preceding humankind, human civilization, consuming nature right up to and beyond the present point. All creatures consume nature to foster their existence. 
earthworms do, eagles do, trees do, we all take from nature, but other forms of life have a give back mechanism. So, you know, sharks eat their neighbors, but they give nutrients back into the sea that powers the phytoplankton, that fertilizes the phytoplankton, that makes it possible for the zooplankton to grow, that makes it possible for the little crustaceans to exist, that the little fish need, and so on up the food chain. And this has been happening through all preceding history, and it's happening even today. But there's one species that would be the ones we see in the mirror when we take that look. We are agents of change and are consuming the natural world at an unprecedented rate, not just for humans, but for all of life on Earth. No other creature has been so powerful in leveling old growth forests, in altering the freshwater systems, in being able to actually alter the nature of nature, to cause polar ice to melt, to change the climate, to change the quality and character of the air we breathe, to bring half the coral reefs down to a point of about half of what they were in a few decades, to reduce sharks by about 90% during those same few decades. The key is knowing. If we only knew our power to consume at such a dangerous, quick level 50 years ago, maybe we would have policies that gave us more incentive to protect large areas of our life support system, the ocean, the high seas. Well, OK, we can't go back. But now we know, now we understand that we are putting ourselves at risk. We need to write ourselves a big insurance policy. Why not half the world, nearly half the world, the high seas, to aggressively look at the services that we gain by leaving the high seas to do what the high seas have always done, capture carbon, generate oxygen, drive the great ocean food webs, drive the the patterns of chemistry that shape the nature of the world. Now is the time, as never before, with knowledge. We have the chance to do that. Nations can play their part. As of the 1980s, when nations officially really claimed out 200 nautical miles and have you know, jurisdiction beyond what we think of as the borders of most nations. This country, for example, has more blue real estate under the ocean and the water column above under our jurisdiction than what we typically think of as the United States. Canada, likewise. Australia is twice as big if you count blue Australia. Little island nations or big ocean nations with a lot to say about the fate of our life support system. OK, so here we are with a chance, with a focus on a special place in the high seas where these charismatic critters, and I mean Barbara Block, of course, <laughs> well, and also the white sharks <laughs> and her team. Bruce Robeson is pretty charismatic too. <laughs> but the idea that we can speak for those who have no voice to speak for themselves. Creatures in the sea, armed with new insights about why the ocean matters to all of us everywhere. If you never see the ocean or touch the ocean, it touches you every time you breathe, every time you drink, just being here. The ocean keeps us alive. And as we said, we have to return the favor. And we have a chance to do this now. The United Nations is gearing up for the first time, thinking about how we can formally make it possible for humans around the world to agree that we need to take care of the high seas with new understanding about why it matters. The economy it matters. Security, absolutely, it matters. Health, if the ocean isn't functioning properly, if we can't breathe, and right now there's serious concern about not just acidification of the ocean, but deoxygenation of the ocean, why aren't we reading this in headlines everywhere and being motivated 
to do something about it. Well, maybe this effort on the part of the Aspen High Seas Initiative can reach a new audience and to build on what the High Seas Initiative, what the Deep Sea Initiative, what many organizations have been working toward independently and sometimes together, but by pulling people together, a big voice, a big blue wave of awareness can motivate people to think about what individually and collectively we can do to literally take care of the ocean that takes care of us. So I'd like to bring on right now uh, one of our one of my fellow ocean elders, one of the advisors to the Aspen High Seas Initiative, one of my all-time, long-time heroes, the Ant Man, E.O. Wilson, who cares about the high seas. Could we have a little clip from the Sea of Hope? We say species are disappearing at the rate of about a thousand times faster than before humans came along. Uh, we'll be down to as few as one half of the species still surviving at the end of the century. Now that is catastrophic. It has consequences that no one can predict, but they're not good. It's quite likely that the whole living world will start to dissolve and go down faster and faster. What would be a solution? If we could save half of the Earth as a reserve, and we included in it especially the, uh, the places that are called hotspots, that is where you have the most endangered species already present, then we could permanently save about the mid 80 percent. The high seas, the area beyond national jurisdiction, covers half the world, 64% of the ocean. It's the largest wilderness on Earth, home for most of life on this planet, and now vulnerable to legal and illegal fishing. You have overfishing near shore, and the fish have disappeared largely. And so ships are going much further out from shore to catch a bare minimum and they stay out there, sometimes for years, and they just keep fishing. Purse signers, trawlers, longliners. You have 95 million tons being taken annually from the ocean. That's the equivalent of the weight of the entire human population taken out of the oceans every year. If we could stop fishing in the open sea. That's a place anybody can go from any country individually or whatever and take what they want. What would actually happen, and two studies have shown this, I mean good science, and a total productivity in fisheries as well as uh, protected biodiversity would increase several times. So, a caveat to this, or these words of wisdom from Ed Wilson. We still have this habit of looking at fish as fisheries, as commodities. We got over looking at birds as commodities, by and large. We think of them as wildlife and have protective policies and look at them with new respect, new values. We used to think of whales primarily as commodities. And for the most part, we've kind of gotten over that. We see whales as valuable creatures alive in their own right. We're getting there with sharks, see their critical ecosystem value. We need to think of all life in the sea as wildlife and look at them with new respect and of course, we will consume ocean wildlife one way or the other. But we must think about the other values and embrace them and protect them as if our lives depend on it because they truly do. And to think about the technologies in addition 
to what it takes to monitor and to police the ocean and enforce whatever regulations we might impose upon ourselves. We need to invest in exploration. It's really frustrating to know how many people have been up in space, even to the moon, and only three people have been to the deepest part of the ocean. We must get down there ourselves. Speak for the fish. Thank you. Thank you, Sonia. So I'm just looking at my watch. We've got about seven minutes here before we're going to go uh, and hear from uh, Dr. Barbara Block. But first, I want to bring in uh, Dr. Francesca Ferretti from Palo Alto. Uh, for, he's at Stanford's Hopkins Marine Station in Monterey, California. Uh, so not quite Palo Alto, I guess, which is leading the expedition to the White Shark Cafe. He's, uh, he's a world expert on global shark populations and the effect that fishing operations have had on them, as well as numerous other factors. So uh, I'm going to uh, toss to Francesco here to uh, give us a little more background before we go out to Barb on the vessel. Thank you very much, Mike, and I'm very honored to be part of this initiative. And just uh, to start off, I wanted to just show you a little clip that will give you a little bit of background about the White Shark team and, and, and the research of this team, which will, uh, will lead into the, the reason why this team is now in the White Shark Cafe. So if you can uh, run that video, that would be, uh, that'd be great. Thank you. The California Current is a river within an ocean. Each spring, it generates an explosion of life. Plankton blooms feed vast schools of anchovies and sardines. They become fuel for predators. Blue and humpback whales arrive first. Elephant seals swim thousands of miles from North Pacific and subpolar seas to breed and molt. They haul out beside even larger colonies of sea lions. These pinnipeds draw the white sharks. Fewer than 300 white sharks swim to California from two mysterious offshore habitats. The waters surrounding Hawaii and an unexplored wilderness, the subtropical gyre nicknamed the White Shark Cafe. This almost invisible migration is being revealed by Stanford University's world-renowned scientist, Dr. Barbara Block. Here we are flying above the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary. Spectacular view today. And we've been studying this region for some time. And what we've learned from the tagging is that the largest migration on Earth occurs beneath the sea here. We have over 100 hours underwater on white sharks with accelerometry, with magnetometry. So that'll give us a pitch with uh, recordings that are visual so that for the first time, we really get to see the ocean from the white shark's perspective. We get to see it from the elephant seal's perspective, from the humpback whale's perspective. Our most consistent resident is a shark we call Mr. Burns. He's a shark that's been seen every year since 2006. We haven't seen him yet, which is a little bit concerning, just because he's so consistent. Scott and Sal have only tagged six sharks in two months. Years when we put out 20 tags and five in one day kind of thing, I don't know. So it was averaging like two tags a day. The missing include Flattop, Scar Girl, and Tom Johnson. Most of the shark migration is far beyond the 200-mile boundary of American waters. On the high seas, there's no protection and extensive international fishing. It raises the question back at the cafe, what could be happening out there? We started looking with satellite technology that picks up radio signals from ships transiting, fly in the sky, and Google's Global Fish Watch. What we saw was Japanese longline vessels and other longline vessels who are transmitting through AIS to the satellites. Barbara and a community of researchers are on a mission to gain World Heritage designation for this ocean realm and protect it the same way we protect the Serengeti Plains of Africa. Great. 
So, um, Francesco, um, yeah. I think it would be really helpful uh, for you at this point to, to share a little bit about your perspective on the, the key importance of the species uh, in the ecosystem, uh, a little more about the voyage itself and, and what, what the, the expected results are, and, and in particular the effects of, of industrial fishing and how that impacts uh, this, this particular species and the rest of the ecosystem out there. Yeah, sure, Mike. Uh, I, I just prepared a, a brief presentation about um, that will give you a little bit of background about the problem, uh, the shark, uh, about the conservation issues uh, that concern uh, sharks. And if I can make this work, can you can you see the the shared screen? Uh, we don't see it yet. All right. Share screen. All right. All right. Here we go. Great. Right. So this is just a little bit of background and uh, about shark fishing. What uh, what's the status of sharks and why it's important to study them. And also give you uh, I'll, I'll provide the example of the white sharks to lead into this uh, um, discussion about the white shark cafe voyage. As we know, uh, in the in the past. Uh, 15, 60 years with the rise, rise of industrial fishing, we have been deploying millions of hooks, uh, plowed the, the seabed with the trawlers and put kilometers of nets to fish our uh, target species, swordfish, tuna, and other, and other brown fish. For and wherever we were fishing for our preferred commercial fish, we were catching a lot of sharks. And most of the time, these were unintended catch. Um, in the, consider that in the 50s or in the, or in the 60s, you were fishing for swordfish in the western, northwestern Atlantic. You were catching uh, five to six sharks for every um, uh, swordfish. And then over time, these uh, uh, exploitation intensified because shark became a target fish. Shark with the rays of, uh, of the uh, demand from Asiatic fin markets, we have been a lot of uh, industrial fishing fleets switched targeting sharks. And now estimates are, are um, uh, so let me, let me just say that uh, wherever we were fishing this and we were catching these sharks, we have been in the last decades, we have been detecting strong and steep declines even in a, in a short period of time. Like for this swordfish fishery in the Northwest Atlantic, we have seen declines of large predatory sharks from 49 to 99%. In the Gulf of Mexico, declines of big sharks were between 79 and 90% in 90 in, uh, in 50 years. And, and uh, from a study we did in the Mediterranean Sea, we basically detected the complete, almost eradication of, uh, of uh, at least functionally, of big sharks in the Mediterranean Sea. Wherever we go, wherever there is fishing, sharks are, being, are declining because they cannot sustain the high rate of uh, extraction we operate with fishes. And now with the, with the increased demand of the Asiatic field market, now in, uh, exploitation intensified, and now it seems that uh, between uh, 29 to 100 million sharks are being killed every every year uh, for uh, target and uh, for di direct and indirect fishing. The consequence is that sharks and their relatives, there are 1,100 species of lamps, moorangs, the sharks and rays, half, one third of their species are endangered or threatened with extinction. Uh, this is from the, this is data from the World Conservation Union and uh, which annual, which periodically they assess the, the conservation status of these species. And the other problem is that half of these species have no data to estimate their conservation status. This is a very important problem because for many of these species, we don't know how much uh, we are taking out of the ocean and uh, we cannot come out with an estimate of, uh, of their status. In the, with these, uh, and with this in mind, uh, with this lack of data, um, um, we, with this in mind, over the last uh, few years, we have been perhaps uh, building one of the biggest database of catch and effort data on sharks from regional fisheries management organization and from, uh, uh, from primary literature, uh, trying to reconstruct the history of exploitation of sharks in different regions around the world. We can recognize hot spots and cold spots of, of exploitation. 
but yet we are using data that is given, uh, given to us by fishers. And so this data can be incomplete and can be, and most of this data is actually unreported for sharks. In fact, estimates are telling us that about 60% of the catch uh, on sharks is unreported. Here in this animation, you'd see just a, uh, a collation of all these data showing how long line fishing spread across the globe from the 1950s to the present day. So each one of these pixels are millions of oaks more red, there are more millions of oaks in the ocean on a five degree uh, scale of resolution. And so we know that uh, from catch and effort data, we can do a lot, but we cannot do too much. There is not the, the entire uh, story. And just to show you an example, um, this is the white shark. Um, the white shark, uh, even for a well-studied species, this is one of the most iconic species in the uh, predator in the planet, possibly one of the most uh, studied species in California. And even for these species, we have pro uh, we have uh, we have some problem problem related to availability of data. We know a lot about their biology, their distribution. We know that, the, for example, the Northeast Pacific population goes from Mexico to Alaska. Uh, most of their uh, distribution is between the west coast of the United States and Mexico and Hawaii. And from pop-up satellite tags, then barbs and other and others, and 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 our team is uh, is uh, have put in the in the ocean. We understand that half of the year uh, sharks are staying in coastal California, feeding on uh, pinny beds like uh, elephant seals and uh, sea lions. And another half of the year, like in, in uh, spring and in, in and in the summer, they are going in offshore aggregation areas, and they are spending their time there. What we don't know about the white sharks is still we have a we have a high uncertainty about their population status. So, uh, although we know a lot about their biology, we know that uh, we know that they are protected now, and that supposedly they have more protection and more monitoring in coastal water when they are in coastal water in the in the fall and in the winter. But we know that sharks have no borders, as as the video introduced uh, earlier. When half of their time, these uh, white sharks are exposed to an international fishing fleet of more than 20 fishing fleets in the open ocean. This is no man's land, and it's very it's very hard to monitor catches in these uh, in these areas, especially for a for a protected species for which a reporting of a catch may cause uh, uh, there is may have additional uh, layers of complexity and uh, and uh, problems, and. Fortunately, right now we are collaborating with this tremendous uh, team of the uh, Global Fishing Watch, SkyTruth, and Google, and other academic partners. And now we can access uh, uh, tremendous, uh, again, changing technologies, which is the AIS data. AIS is Automatic Identification System. This is a, an anti collision system that all fishing, uh, all marine vessels uh, over 300 tons are required to have in their on board, they are communicating their position periodically, every five seconds, and then from this data, we can, we analyzing this data, we can, um, we can understand real dynamics of fishing fleet in the ocean. So we are doing, we have been doing a monumental work on uh, using uh, data integration from regional fisheries management organization and uh, artificial intelligence to understand how much of this data is from fishing fleets. And then from within fishing fleets, understand what kind of fishing fleets these were, like uh, trawlers, longliners, poor sailing. So dividing, classifying these uh, this pattern. And from this work, for the first time last month, we were able to come out with the first estimate of the global, global footprint of fisheries. We understood that uh, more than 55% of the ocean is fished. Right now, there, there is fishing. You see in the big panel here, Fishing hour, hours per square kilometers of all fishing fleets we have classified and recognized. And on the, on the side panels, you see the distribution of troll fishing, drifting longline fishing, per seine fishing. And you can see that the drifting longline fishing, which is the most important fishing gear in the high seas, is the most fishing gears in the globe and is the one causing most damage to large, uh, large predatory fish. Another interesting thing we, we understood is that fishing has became a relentless act activity. In fact, if you want to predict the patterns of fishing um, across the globe, across space or, or, or time, 
you would predict as a biologist, you will expect that uh, fish shares are going where the fish are. And at these global scales, perhaps the best predictor you have of a fish abundance is the abundance of primary productivity. So, so where the plankton is, where the plankton is, is where the small fishes are and where the large fishes are. Well, we, f we understood that this is actually one of the weakest predictor of a, of a fishing effort. In fact, if you wanna predict the patterns of fishing effort, you wanna understand here, for example, in the first panel, you see fishing hours across latitudes and across time on four years. And all these patterns you are seeing are not, are not related to biological variables, but are related very much to human, social, and political uh, events, like New, Year, New Year's, like these three streaks here are New Year's and Christmas vacation. Here, all these streaks here are whole weekends. Here is when fishing in China stops for, a, for an annual moratoria. So uh, fishing, in the high seas and all over is becoming uh, more detached from natural cycle and actually a very, a truly industrial activity. Well, we know that, however, that uh, uh, fish and fishers need to go where the fish are. And fortunately, we have other sources of data we can use to understand the impact of the interaction between fishing fleets and fish. Here, for example, it's a huge database, perhaps the biggest database of animal tracking data uh, collated and created for the top uh, project in the census of marine life. These are more than 4,000 4, satellite tags on 23 species of, of uh, marine predators from fish, sharks, and birds. And then we can use this data to predict this, the preferred habitat of these animals. And then we can overlap this data with the, with the uh, fishing data that we have from the IES to understand areas of high fish and fisheries interaction. For example, here, this is just the, the number of fishing hours deployed across the Northeast Pacific. And here in the square, you see the white shark cafe in a practical, this practical share that identify this uh, ocean uh, aggregation area. We see that there is a lot of, uh, there is a substantial amount of fishing here from, uh, from, from long liners. And so we are using these data with the top data, with the tracking data and other modeling to understand hotspots of, uh, of interaction and also including the interaction between white sharks and, uh, and, um, and fishing fleets. And now to introduce uh, Barb and then to just give the, uh, um, leave at the stage to the people in Farkor, I wanna show you where they are. They are here at the uh, White Shark Cafe. This is a plot I made with, uh, uh, with a few days of data. Uh, it is showing in white, so you are seeing pop-up tags, tags that are popping up from the white sharks in the area. They are drifting and they are waiting to be collected by the team that is going around with the FACOR. And around, you see there are 15, at least 15 fishing longline fishers that are catching um, uh, uh, tuna, swordfish, and, and sharks. And so this is, uh, this is just to show you that this area is not really a desert area, but it's very crowded with, uh, with industrial activity and with uh, fishing activities. And with that, I will uh, I just uh, I'll leave it that to you and, uh, and uh, eventually to Barb. Great. Excellent. Thank well, thank you, uh, Francesco. I think that was a really uh, great setup, terrific way for us to kind of tee up where we're headed right now, which is exactly into that box. Um, so do we have uh, Barb on the line here as we're, as we're getting her queued up? I'll just say that, uh, again, she's about 1,300 nautical miles uh, east of Honolulu uh, on board the research vessel Falcor. Uh, Barb Locke is the chief scientist on this first expedition uh, out there to understand uh, what the white sharks are up to. And I think we've got Barb here ready to go. So I'll turn it over to you, Barb. Thanks. Hello, I just want to check a uh, sound check from a thousand nautical miles off the west coast of North America. Are you there? We're here. We got it. Sounds great. All right. Um, well, um, it's great to be with you. I'm just getting oriented to see if we have the screen here. All right. Uh, we're out uh, just exiting the White Shark Cafe where we've been for three weeks. And uh, we left on April 20th from Honolulu. We traveled about 1,300 nautical miles to the center of the Northeast Pacific. And as of 3 a.m. Uh, last night, we stopped operations on one of the most extraordinary oceanographical, uh, oceanographic uh, 
ships that we have in our fleet, the RV Felcor, and we're now headed towards San Diego. So it's a real joy to be with everyone at the Smithsonian, many of you who I know personally and out at Hopkins, to tell you about what's going on on the ship and what we've uh, been doing. So I want to point you to the screen with the uh, white shark in it, and uh, we're going to just go through a few key results. If I could have the next slide, please. So I've done a quick with the team on board. There's uh, 21 scientists, I mean 11 scientists and 30 crew on board, and I've done a quick by the numbers from everybody uh, summary of what we've been doing. And most importantly, we got here because we tagged in the fall and winter back in the California National Marine Sanctuaries, 38 white sharks with two types of satellite tags. And the dream of the voyage was the white sharks were going to show us a place that we knew existed. They'd already shown it to us before during the census of marine life, but we had hoped that we could go there this particular year, three years in the making this expedition, about four months of intensive daily tagging we got the tags on and we were hoping the sharks would guide us on our journey. And sure enough, they did. 50% of the white sharks popped in the cafe. And the image, I think that's on your screen above our screen, uh, is the uh, live data access server we have for our voyage. The blue is our track line. The white are our pop-up tags. And uh, they show us where the white sharks popped up. Now, because 50% popped in the uh, archival tag zone, or excuse me, the, uh, the, uh, the journey zone that we were going in, the White Track Cafe, we were able to recover these tags. And I can't tell you how much this was like a big White Track treasure hunt, you know, with a big voyage and everybody looking for the tags. But we did a fantastic job of getting the crew uh, totally behind what we were trying to do, recover something that's the size of this microphone and uh, in a big sea, and we were able to get these tags which have a treasure trove of data. They have one to three second data, the highest resolution data we've ever obtained from white sharks. And overnight in three weeks, we've doubled a data set that we had over 20 years. So we collected 10 of these uh, computers back from the white sharks, and they have about uh, almost 3,000 days of data that we'll be analyzing, I'm sure, for the next uh, year or two. In addition, uh, Robeson is going to tell us about the uh, nine ROV dives. We collected 70 hours of observation directly. One of the great assets of this trip is the oceanographic voyage has an ROV. It has a CTD. It has many of the traditional oceanographic tools. And we're going to compare in situ oceanography with uh, the information from the animals as well as uh, from eDNA, environmental DNA that we have here. So we have about five different types of observations, acoustics, DNA, uh, direct observation of the sharks, oceanography, and um, ROV dives along with uh, a variety of uh, drones that are with us to put together the environment of the shark. Our eDNA, eDNA team has taken over 300 samples from the hydrocast from the ship, and so far, with less than 10% of the data analyzed, they have already identified 110 vertebrate genera. So we focused only on vertebrates so far on this trip. When we get home, we can focus on invertebrates and phytoplankton. And this team has a minai and sequen sequencer on board. We're one of the first teams on the planet to be sequencing along our journey. And at five sites, we've seen white shark DNA in the water that we've already identified. We've done over uh, 80 scientific stations. 24 of them are oceanographic. We're analyzing the chemistry, the oceanography, the currents, the nutrients, the chlorophyll in order to better understand why this, what traditionally is thought of as an ocean desert, might be a place that's a hot spot. And then uh, we've done 14 midwater trawls, very traditional technique. We're towing so that we can actually see what lives here that might be the prey layer that will attract white sharks. And then we're going to analyze those prey with isotopic data that uh, Dr. Carlisle from the University of Delaware will work up in order for us to understand on 800 of the individuals that we've identified what uh, isotopes they're made out of. And then we've had 10 baited cams. Our shark ecology team has recorded mahi, mako, and blue sharks in the cafe environment. So you can go after this uh, talk and go to whitetrackcafe.org and you can follow along by first clicking on our map. That map has sort of been an updated automated chart the whole time telling us what we're doing. Inside the map, you'll see 17 triangles. And those are 17 of the white sharks that we had their tag release inside the cafe box and it worked. And I can't tell you how happy 
I am that it did work. On the outside of the box, you can see uh, a live map, and that live map has uh, the white shark uh, satellite tags as white dots that we actually, in a blue trace with our ship, we went right along to and uh, picked up right out of the ocean. So I want you to focus for a second on the map, if it's up on your screen, and, and just look at how big the North Pacific is, uh, the size of North America, and this place that we've traveled to. So imagine what we did. We left Hawaii. There were no points on the map. We kind of knew this was where they should be. And just as if we released 34 mountain lions from California and expected them to be in Colorado, we did this with white sharks, a great iconic predator from the western shores of North America. And sure enough, they ended up in a place that's about the size of Colorado in the middle of the Northeast Pacific. We came here physically. We've sampled physically, as I said, with a hydrocast, a CTD. We were able along the track five times so far to identify white shark DNA in the water right where we were sampling, evidence that this animal has shed DNA uh, right in the waters that we're sampling, uh, making this technique a viable way of in situ and in vivo finding white sharks. And then from an oceanographic perspective, you're looking at sections that uh, Jan Whitting has put together, one of our oceanographers on board. They are from the 30 plus stations that we've done of oceanography. And the most important things that I want to bring home to you is that we were told we're going to a desert and a gyre, a place that we think of traditionally as being very stable. And what we found that will highlight in the fluorescence, and we'll show it to you again, is there's a layer of carbon about 100 meters down that the satellites can't see. So we came out here looking at a satellite view of a place that had very low productivity from the sky. But when we got here, we found that like a sandwich, the way the oceanography layered things is it made it so that we had a lot of mesoscale eddies and a lot of carbon that was near the surface, but beneath the place that a satellite could see it. So I'm not going to dwell on the key oceanographic findings, except to say at the bottom, the peak phytoplankton biomass resides below 100 meters. And think of this as the, the carbohydrate and the carbon that's going to feed the prey below. There's a lot of it here, much more than would have been predicted by an Earth orbiting satellite. We had University of Delaware's team put out a Slocum glider, one of our remote vehicles that increased our area that we could actually uh, sample in oceanographically. The Slocum glider was on an automated path that was set up by Danielle on board that enabled us to actually uh, really cut across the cafe for 11 days. The sections are all online and our live access server hit the Slocum glider. And again, you could probably highlight for yourself if you're interested, this open blue, it's as blue and empty as you might imagine, but then this chlorophyll layer at 100 meters that might be the source of the plants that are feeding the prey that basically might make up the base of the food chain. And then interesting enough, we had an oxygen sensor live in the cafe, and it really gives us a sense from high oxygen to low in blue of what's the volume that a white shark who's got a high metabolic rate might be able to, to uh, associate with. So down to about 400 meters, we had a lot of oxygen, but then it amazingly decreased right down to the amount that would be difficult for any large endothermic vertebrate to handle. Most amazingly, we had a sail drone or two on this trip, two of them from saildrone.com. They were on one of the first trips in which they had a three intense sampling devices, transducers that allowed us to see the prey below us, transducers that mapped the currents, and then one that listened for white sharks with acoustic tags. We had about, uh, about 30 acoustic tag white sharks in the system uh, that we tagged this year, maybe 60 overall that could have been here. And then it has 32 other sensors that were meteorological and measured uh, various things like uh, surface water temperature and the wind speed. It's uh, going to stay behind us and just shown here, for those of you who are looking up at the screen, the red is the track of the sail drone. And you're looking at a week in the life of a sail drone down at one of our stations, it's still going on. And the green is the echo sounder, actually, when it hits a prey layer, as uh, seen in our other screen here, it reflects back off the uh, different densities and gives us an idea of what's present. So it's a remarkable device showing us the sunrise sunset movement of the biomass of prey that we've been looking at beneath the ship. So we've got the sail drones currently coming towards us right now. We're exiting the cafe. We're up in the blue here. We're coming out. And the sail drone will continue the journey of following the white sharks' ecology and their areas of interest while we're headed back. 
Now that's the ROV on board called Sebastian. And I'm gonna bring up uh, Dr. Bruce Robeson, who's made the observations directly with the, with the uh, ROV. And so Bruce, will you come on up and tell us what the Midwater Trial Team and the uh, ROV dives uh, into the empty blue have shown us. So come on over here, Bruce. Hello. This area that we've been studying for the last few weeks is a, a crossroads for not only white sharks, but a variety of other large uh, species, uh, swordfish, tuna, and, and squids as well. What we've been attempting to do- Can you, can you hear us, that. Bruce? Can you, could you move the microphone a little closer to your mouth, please? You're a little hard to hear, thank okay. you. What we've been working on is characterizing the midwater community here down to a, a thousand meters. Who lives here? What kinds of categories of, of animals occur here and what relative abundance patterns? As Barb mentioned, people used to refer to this area as a desert. But I think what we've found is that it is anything but a desert. We found a surprising richness in the midwater fauna and a, and a surprising diversity as well. Uh, we we used the ROV Sebastian to, to uh, help us establish the structure and composition of, of the midwater community. And the goal is to establish a baseline. Any area that you want to protect needs a baseline from which to start your comparisons with changes that may come, either human-induced changes or natural changes. Without a baseline, you don't know what you're dealing with. What we've accomplished here is to begin the fundamental creation of a baseline for this particular area. Uh, with three weeks of ROV dives and net trawls and acoustic surveys, we've got a good start. And fortunately, we're able to compare these data with a, a 30 year uh, baseline that we've established in, in Monterey Bay. So uh, with, the, with the basics of a baseline in hand, we can move forward and make the kinds of measurements uh, in the future that will allow us to make policy decisions about what sorts of things uh, we can do to understand and uh, help an area like this to, to persist. Now, the ROV itself has been an extraordinary tool uh, as Sylvia knows, there's no substitute for a pair of human eyes seeing the habitat you want to study. Well, we couldn't get down there ourselves, but we did the next best thing and used a, a 4K video camera mounted on the, on the Sebastian to give us detailed, high-resolution imagery of the animals that occur in the upper kilometer of the water column. One other aspect of this to uh, remember is that in an area that you want to protect, an area of the open ocean, it's not just the surface or the seafloor, but all of the water column in between. The largest living space on Earth is the oceanic water column, on average 4,000 meters deep. That's, that's two and a half miles of, of water. Most of the animals out here live in the water column not on the surface, not on the seafloor, but swimming through that vast, fluid, three-dimensional space that is virtually impossible to study any other way than getting into it and seeing it uh, and making measurements directly. Hmm? Okay, Barb says we have a movie. Perhaps you will <laughs> see what we're talking about. Can you run the movie? Because we'll have some of the highlights. Yep. We'll cue that up now. Thanks, Barb. Thanks. We'll come back to the slides, but we just want to, the movies will have the highlights of the ROV dives. Let's 
So this is a video that was actually produced, uh, shot and produced during the course of the voyage. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Bob says he finished about 10 minutes ago. So this is literally what we call hot off the press. We've been planning for this voyage for over three years. I've been thinking about it for over a decade. And what we're going to do is depart from Honolulu for the White Shark Cafe. This is a place, the only way we know about it is white sharks took us there. And in this region, there's a gathering place. And why these animals gather here, we don't know. I mean, all of us on here are incredibly excited. And this White Shark Cafe is one of those last real expeditions. We, we know very little about it. We have no idea about why this massive predator is leaving California coming here. There must be something so important here. Part of this is about discovering what's in the ocean. And the white sharks are leading us there. Why do the sharks come out to this remote part of the ocean? One of the ways we approach answering that question is to characterize the habitat. And we put together a a variety of, of tools and, and approaches to let us do that. What are the conditions in the water column itself? Temperature, oxygen, salinity. We're going to be sending sound waves into the water column to see what reflections of that sound tell us about the concentrations of animals versus depth. We're using eDNA to tell us how different species of animals occupy this space. We've been using the sail drones as scouts. The sail drones have been out here surveying the region in advance of, of our arrival and they will continue to survey it while we're here. And they can alert us to things that may be just over the horizon. We're using net toes to go down and, and collect animals from different parts of the water column so we can see who's here. There's something really special about bringing the net up. It's like unwrapping the president, and then inside is this trove of just beautiful creatures. Just looking at the animals is pretty awe-inspiring, and so it's hard not to get excited when you see these creatures with totally bizarre morphology and, you know, what does it mean to live mostly in the dark? For me, there's no substitute for direct observation. I want to see what's there. And if I can't go down myself, then the best thing is to use is a, an underwater vehicle, a remotely operated vehicle. tag. It has a light sensor, a temperature sensor, a pressure sensor, and it has a very accurate clock. It goes on the white shark, the white shark carries the tag, and then at a point that we've programmed into the tag related to this voyage, it pops off, the float brings it to the surface, and it sends radio transmissions to Earth orbiting satellites. And we're now recovering each of these instruments as it comes up. When we get the tag back, it has second-by-second second behavioral data and environmental data on what the white sharks do. Nice one, Nick. <laughs> it's a female. It's been on for five months. Three-second interval data. Wow, we got a bite on it, too. Look at this. Look at these deep chips. Whoa. 
Look at that, a lot of rapid oscillatory diving here. This is spanning one, two, three, four, five days of intensive diving that just continues. Wow. Look at this. That's oh incredible. Oh my God, look at this. This guy is active. So this is right up when the, until the tag popped up. It's got the most yeah. intense diving about here. That's really cool. We're in a spot where rapid oscillatory diving is like really intense right now. Yeah. Look at this, day and night. It's gold, you guys. It's just gold in the form of data. <laughs> that is so cool. We are trying to recover the glider. It is at the surface, drifting. Uh, we're having a little bit of issues getting it to give us an updated location. Probably it's getting covered. We're still in the water? With water. It's still on the surface, yeah. Right here, I think I could give you a bearing. Although Otis is mainly focusing on the oceanography and measuring what's going on um, underneath the surface of the ocean. Otis can also listen for tags that are in different species, so we can kind of use Otis as a sentinel underneath the ocean, kind of spying on who's down there for us while we're up on the ship doing all the other amazing science. The high seas covers almost half this planet, and in the high seas, there are very few rules. It's almost the Wild West. And so if we're going to save white sharks and other iconic animals such as tunas and other sharks for the next generation, we have to start thinking about where the boundaries should be, where the protection should be. This cruise is actually a beginning in which we're going to go out, offer the opportunity for policy changes that protect a region that no one would think about needs protection for white sharks. Through new knowledge, we can reduce ignorance and then translate that into action. Okay, so we're back uh, live. And then uh, I think I think what you've garnered from both Roby and his and the baseline his team has established with the midwater trawl and the ROV observations, the eDNA, is we have discovered out here that this isn't any desert. There's a trophic cascade that's available here, a trophic uh, resource that could be viable for any large predator, whether it's a big eye tuna or whether it's a white shark. And that's what we've discovered uh, on our journey. So we just want to go forward a little bit and just tell you just a little bit more about this exciting treasure hunt we're on. That's uh, Taylor Chapel and Paul Knive, and they were at the bow of the boat a lot in this position, not an easy position on some of the rougher days. And they were hunting for this device. This is uh, the golden device. It's a small pop-up tag uh, found in the ocean. And we did it uh, nine times. It was quite incredible. And we collected them nine times. And they were very, very difficult in the high seas to find. We'll let you know that. <laughs> the, the goal of finding them is to get these tracks. So I'm going to show you really quickly Tracks that my laboratory, uh, shout out to the team back at Stanford that crunched this stuff the last uh, two days. Uh, this is a 15 foot shark named Tilden. And you can go to our uh, Meet the Sharks page and meet Tilden and see a lot of video about Tilden, real nice shark. This is uh, Chippy, another male. And you can see they're leaving California and coming right down to the cafe. This is a female shark named Leona, a very big shark, uh, probably tagged by Taylor at uh, Año Nuevo. And then uh, one more shark for you is a real favorite of uh, all of ours called Heffalump. Heffalump is a lovely large female who actually came to the cafe during, right before our trip it looks like, and then headed back to uh, Monterey and was recovered right outside Dr. Robeson's office. The tag that is. <laughs> and then uh, Teresa, one more female shark. Again, showing this incredible story where we leave California and these sharks are coming right down here to the cafe. And then finally, just a couple of really nice point cloud plots done by uh, Dr. I mean, Mr. James Ganong. There's Chippy, uh, one of the females, showing a slight different look, but the ribbon of diving uh, down at the cafe, the colors being different temperature, really clear there. And then this is one of the females rotating in front of you there where we're getting this high resolution one second data, able to see much more about their dial behavior, surface sometimes deep the others, 
the colors being the rainbow of the temperatures they're going through. So we've got this data to study for the next uh, year, and I just want to take you in close to what's got us super excited. We had the best technology we've ever had on these animals, and then we recovered it. So what we're zeroing in on is a plot at the top that is uh, a male animal moving through the water column with pressure, with different behavior. It's about a 10-day piece of time. And then we have velocity here of the shark coming up and the shark going down, and then the rainbow of colors as he goes down to four or 500 meters. And what I want you to notice is that is what we can do with these new technology tags is we can zoom in now to three days of data, and we might be able to see something like a dive as the animal goes down, and with the velocity record, we can actually see the activity of the thrusting of the tail and begin to understand the behaviors. And as some of you know, we're interested in whether the animals are foraging or whether they're potentially mating. This is that same shark now down to 24 hours of data, a single dive, and then looking again at increased activity on that dive, which might tell us if the shark is uh, targeting a prey item like a big eye tuna. And then finally with these tags, down to six hours of diving in which you know exactly what the animal's doing. It was thrusting as it came up, it came back down, probably coasted down, and then used its tail down here in this part, and then had a few spike dives where maybe it came up underneath the prey, just like many of Roby's mesopelagic fish. So I'm gonna end by telling you, we've proven once again that there is a place in the Northeast Pacific that white sharks knew about long before humans, in which they're coming outside the boundaries of the EEZ, they're headed to the high seas, and that's a bit of a place that is unprotected at this time. There is no rule against setting long lines in this region for big eye tuna, of course, and uh, those long lines potentially may bycatch white sharks. We were surprised on our trip a little bit about the fact that we happened to be here during what is a big eye tuna season, and uh, Francesca put these slides together, listening through AIS to the radio signatures coming from ships in the region, and then uh, using uh, tools of AI, he was able to uh, work with the team uh, from SkyTruth to basically get down to what are the long line sets going on. And we had a significant event happen in which we had a long line set across our path. This is the ship moving. White are the pop-up tags. And clearly, while we were here, white sharks that swam through our cruise box in red were being exposed to fishing techniques that were targeted for big eye tuna uh, that potentially have the opportunity to, by mistake, bycatch white sharks. And that was pretty revealing uh, during this voyage and argues to the reason that we're asking UNESCO and others to consider this place as a place that really needs protection as soon as possible if we want to keep something as iconic and wild as a white shark protected in our North Pacific Ocean. So I'm going to end there and uh, just remind you as we go away that that star is us today that while the box looks big on some of our projections, the North Pacific is a huge ocean. It's a very big place, and our box is not a very big spot inside that North Pacific Ocean. And to imagine again that we could set off some tags on some white sharks, and sure enough, they hit the box, and then we came to visit with them. So we know that this box is real, that it's an oasis, an oasis that these animals know about, they've taught us about, and we're asking our friends at UNESCO if they could help us think about how my, we might protect this place. Back to Washington. Amazing. Thank you. Barb, thanks so much. You've got a room full of incredibly appreciative and attentive folks here who've been really happy to, to receive all this information. And, and I think it's just a remarkable uh, accomplishment that you and the team have, have put together out there. So thank you so much for sharing it with us and for, for taking the time to to head out there and to make these incredible discoveries. And I know we're going to have some great questions about that coming up. But before we jump into audience questions, I, I, we've got one more participant who's been very patient hanging on with us here through this, through this uh, entire event. And that's uh, Dr. Fanny Duvier, uh, who is with us from Paris. Uh, uh, Dr. Duvier is a coordinator of the marine program at the World Heritage Center at UNESCO, uh, which considers the nominations for marine areas um, as world heritage sites. Um, so, Fanny, you heard Barb's pitch. What do you think? <laughs> Put you on the spot. Well, I mean, time was flying by. I was impressed it was already my turn, so it was not much of a patience. It's absolutely fascinating. It's, we wrote about it in 2016 when we launched our report, but uh, really, when you see 
what it is all about is just absolutely spectacular. So first of all, um, from Paris, a really big applause here uh, from us because this is absolutely top science and top research that makes the world ultimately to understand what this is all about. And that's the only way to really make sure that people will ultimately protect it. It's to make sure that they understand what is there. So thank you, Barbara. Thank you to all of the teams that have been so dedicated for almost a decade, as Barbara said, uh, to make this happen. Uh, and I'm delighted to be here on this call. So shoot your questions. Um, sure. Well, why don't we start real quickly with one, which is just to, to, if you could walk us a little bit through the process here, given you know what we know, what they're finding out, obviously we've got a long way to go before these data are final and before we're in a place where we really know what the full scope of the results are from this voyage. But, but if you can just walk us briefly through um, how the mechanism of, of sort of how the World Heritage Convention protects these places in the ocean and, and what it would take uh, ultimately to include a place like White Shark Cafe uh, as a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Sure, I think today uh, still the majority of the people connect World Heritage with cultural places. It is the place, the places that we think about are the Taj Mahal uh, in India, it's the Angkor Wat in Cambodia, it's the Grand Canyon in the US, it's, it's places that we typically think about on land. What very few people know is that the World Heritage Convention also protects today 49 flagship marine protected areas, uh, which uh, are spread across the planet. Um, there are places like uh, Australia's Great Barrier Reef, uh, Galapagos Islands, uh, the second largest reef on our planet, Belize Barrier Reef. These are places that currently are of what we call, that's at the heart of the World Heritage Convention, uh, of outstanding universal value. That means that those places are so important to humanity that the protection of those sites cannot be left to just one country. What the World Heritage Convention ultimately does in its day-to-day -day operations is uniting 193 nations behind the shared and common commitment uh, and responsibility to protect what is of our common heritage of humanity. Now, there are 49 ocean places today across 37 countries, um, but we cannot really call it today, when you look from a marine perspective at least, we cannot really call it a World Heritage Convention because currently it does not apply to the open ocean. It doesn't apply to areas beyond national jurisdiction, which ultimately is about half of our planet. So we had in 19, uh, sorry, in 2011, we had a major audit of the World Heritage List. We have 1,073 sites uh, today on UNESCO's World Heritage List. And the audit came to the conclusion that, uh, the same conclusion that we cannot call this World Heritage representing everything that embeds our civilization and our um, and humanity uh, when it doesn't apply to half of the planet. And so the audit recommended to the state parties, to the 193 state parties of the World Heritage Convention, which as a matter of fact is nearly universal today, uh, recommended that the state parties would look into uh, areas beyond national jurisdiction and would look into how that convention actually could apply. And so that's what we did. Um, we did that, in fact, uh, with a whole, whole team of people. And uh, I'm very grateful to say that uh, Dr. Um, uh, Block was uh, also part of uh, this, the scientific advice that was delivered to all of that. But, and I will hold it up. We launched the publication uh, in 2016 that for the first time really looked whether the World Heritage Convention would be able to apply to uh, areas beyond national jurisdiction. And among those, we had two approaches. We wanted to look legally whether the convention would apply. And the answer is yes, and I can talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Uh, but we also looked at what sites would be the sort of, quote, uh, great barrier reefs of the high seas. And we didn't want to come up with a huge list. Ultimately, there are lots of places. Um, and some people would argue that the entire high seas should be war heritage. But practically speaking, we identified uh, for the moment, uh, an initial uh, set of sites, five of them, of which the Shark, White Shark Cafe uh, is part. So I'm happy to talk a little bit more, but maybe I should um, leave it for a minute with that. That's great. Thanks. It's a terrific summary. Um, Barb, do you want to weigh in at this point? Are you still uh, with us there on the vessel? Um, any follow-ups uh, for, uh, for Fanny? Uh, first off, Fanny, thanks. Can you hear me? I want to check again. Yep, we're good. Absolutely. Good. Live, live, and, and then, uh, 
So Fanny, I want to thank you for being here with us. It's a really a great honor to have you on the phone call and to connect uh, UNESCO to the FALCOR. I believe that with this trip, we've really confirmed once again that this spot is as real as we can make it. It first uh, appeared with the Census of Marine Life's effort. A lot of funding has been put into finding this spot, and now this spot has been confirmed again. I think we're really at a point where we want to take the torch forward to you. I do remember a phone call or an email in which Fanny said to me, do you have any pictures of the White Shark Cafe? <laughs> and at the time, I kind of laughed and said, you know, Fanny, it's a long way from Hawaii. And now we can tell you we have pictures from the White Shark Cafe. It's a real place, and we will be glad to deliver those to UNESCO. Excellent. Good. Now, maybe maybe a few uh, points at, at, at what really um, does it all mean, right? Because being just a World Heritage Site, obviously, it's the recognition. And the recognition is important. I think in the minds of people, what it does is it makes that immediate and natural association that that place has something unique and exceptional. Typically, people actually really want to go there. There are lots of studies of people that when they come across a World Heritage Site, they naturally will say, this is something that I should see, I should know about, and I should care about, because it's something that is just truly unique. It's a natural association. And when you think about a high seas, when we first launched the uh, report, then we had a lot of courage. Why? Because when people made those kind of associations, people do not necessarily know that much about the high seas, because it's just far away. There's not much imagery uh, to show. And it's natural, because it's just very hard to get there and extreme, extremely expensive to get there. So, um, but that's only one part of the story. See that what the majority of the people do not um, know and, 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 and not really realize, and therefore not really use, is um, what World Heritage is really about is it is about protection. Once a site is inscribed on the UNESCO World Heritage list, it, the site becomes subject to a continuous, continuous monitoring and evaluation system. So every day, my work, the, the work of my team, everybody at the World Heritage Center and our advisory bodies, we constantly look at these places and we monitor, along, along with a lot of scientists and NGOs that are, that are advising us and giving us the information, but we ultimately really look what is happening at those places. And once we see things that are not compatible, uh, like unsustainable fisheries, like you name it, whatever it should be that shouldn't happen in a place because it's not compatible with its special status, those are the things that we provide to the World Heritage Committee to take decisions on behalf of humanity, finally on behalf of humanity, because that's what they represent. And they do that to say to the countries or the operators to say, look, this is not what you should be doing in this place. This is something that is not compatible with having something that is so unique and exceptional. So the recognition is one thing, and obviously it is hugely important. It's what I call would call the soft power of the World Heritage Convention, which is extremely valuable today when you think about things so invisible, so intangible as the White Shark Cafe. But really, what the World Heritage Convention can bring to all of this is all over 40 years of experience across 193 state parties, countries basically, that share that common view that those places should be protected. It's 40 years of experience of monitoring, evaluating, and ultimately, at the end of the day, holding nations accountable of what it is that we're doing in those places and what we should protect for our future generations. So I think that's really what is behind this, and that's really why it is so important to look at World Heritage and a World Heritage designation. Now, perhaps to finalize that, why hasn't it happened yet? Now, it's a very interesting question. Um, if it were up to me uh, and I was to decide, well, it would be tomorrow, World Heritage, because all five of these sites, including the White Shark Cafe, obviously do have a potential outstanding universal value. That's what the scientific community so clearly uh, shows, and that's what the voyage so clearly confirms. Now, it's ultimately always the World Heritage Committee, which is 21 members that come together, that decide over these things. But the reason why it really hasn't happened today is just historic. It's a historic oversight that the World Heritage Convention does not apply today, because the World Heritage Convention was created in 1972, um, and the uh, United Nations Law of the Sea Convention was established in 1982. So it's 10 years after. So at the time that the World Heritage Convention uh, was um, was born, uh, we were just not making those distinctions between 
uh, what is beyond national jurisdiction and what is within national jurisdiction. So we brought lawyers together um, in 2016 for the first time, and they came to the conclusion that in the preamble of the World Heritage Convention, it clearly says it can protect any place, no matter to whom it belongs and no matter to where it is located. Now, the historical oversight lies in, of course, in the operational guidelines, which are modifiable. Ultimately, the World Heritage Committee can um, perfectly decide to modify its operational guidelines. And that's where we're here now, and perhaps I'll conclude on that. Uh, where we are right now is um, to, to provide to the World Heritage Committee the mechanisms by which it actually might look into protecting those World Heritage sites. Now, whether we should be inscribing them on the World Heritage list or whether we should just go back to the origins of the convention um, in its early days and look at those ways that, it, that huge conservation, I mean, big conservation uh, gains were made at the time when we moved um, the Abu Simbel temples to higher grounds from where they are today. Uh, that's an open question. And so we will bring again uh, experts, legal experts, um, uh, both in high seas and world heritage matters. Um, we will bring them together uh, at the end of this year to question how we practically can make that happen. So I wanted to share some of these things because ultimately I think the World Heritage Convention should apply to these areas. It is a World Heritage Committee that decides, but the very first steps have been taken on our end um, when it comes to at least pulling the signs together. And this voyage, what you are doing uh, right now over the past three, we three uh, weeks, uh, that is really hit on the mark because what we really need is to be able to show tangibly uh, what it means and why it should be protected and ultimately why it should be war heritage for the protection of future generations. That's great. All right. Okay, thank you, Fanny. Yeah, thanks so much. So we've got, uh, while we still have this connection from Paris to the Central Pacific, um, I want to open this opportunity up for folks here in the audience to ask any questions that you might have been coming up with sort of over the course of the uh, hour and a half that we've been here uh, hearing these amazing results. Um, is there anyone who's got a question that we can throw out from the audience? Sure, go right ahead. Sure. So the question is, um, we know that uh, the, the, one of the questions that you went out there to answer was the, the behavior of the sharks on site. Are they feeding? Are they mating? What are they doing? Uh, and, and the question is, are, it, it sounds like there's been some feeding behavior likely documented. How sure are you of that? And is there any evidence or do you expect to be able to find evidence of any other behaviors out there? Okay, so we literally just left the cafe this morning at 3 a.m. And we've literally just begun to get the data back. So I want to remind everyone it was a push to even get the data crunched so you could see it right now. We have the most data we've ever had from these technologies called biologging technologies than ever before. These wearables for sharks have given us second by second data that are going to allow us to analyze the behaviors, whether they're foraging, whether they're mating, what's going on here. We're not going to step too far out today because we haven't had any time to look at the data. We've just received the data and we've just collected the tags. But what we will say is it's a place where both could happen. Now we knew that before we came out here, I'm gonna pass it to Taylor, one of our shark ecologists on board. What I will say that I didn't know uh, before I got here was just how viable a place this is for, for a ocean trophic ecology in which a, a white shark could have a viable meal. So what we do know is that it's a place thriving with squid and mesopelagic animals with big eye tuna fishers all around us. We can assume there's big eye tuna here too. And what the white sharks are doing in terms of their exact foraging behavior, we don't know yet, but I now have with this team, the data set that we can start to analyze that. And I'm gonna give you one of our finest shark ecologists from Stanford, uh, Dr. Taylor Chapel, to add in what, what he would like to say. Thanks, Barb. Um, I guess I would just uh, echo a lot of that. And the T Taylor, move um, a little into your right so we can see you, please. There you go. There way. he is. Sorry. All right. Can you get me there <laughs> now? Yeah. Um, hi. So I, I wanted to argue, um, just echo a little bit what Barb said um, uh, and, and add a little bit to that. And one is that getting these tags back are a, a treasure trove that we haven't had 
um, as much access to. So having males and females, which we are suspecting are doing different things out here, um, having you know really rich data sets from them is, is going to be fantastic for us once we get back to the lab. Um, I guess the, the overall excitement, though, is that we now know the potential um, of what could be going on out here. We had these ideas that it was either mating or feeding, but now with Bruce's team to really look at what's in the water column, um, the folks from Delaware being able to tell us a lot of the, the oceanography, um, as well as the other teams, we can start to see what the potentials are. And um, as, as Barb said, we're not there yet. We're just seeing the data come in now, but it really has opened up the, the options of what we're going to be able to tell and not tell. Great. Um, Sylvia's got a question. <laughs> you guys, I'm going to come back to you, so keep thinking. So, team, one of the things that excites me the most about what you're doing out there is putting the spotlight on the deep scattering layer that was maybe first recognized as a living phenomenon in the 60s, observed directly from the Alvin in about 1966 in the North Atlantic. And you're right, that this is really important, that evaluation of productivity from the sky doesn't cut it. Um, all of us who've been down at 100 or 200 or even 300 meters have witnessed photosynthesis beyond where textbooks tell you that it ought to be able to occur. And we've witnessed these bands of life. But making the direct connection, the biogeochemistry of the ocean with a predator prey anchored in the productivity of photosynthesis. It's not necessarily at the top that channels through all of these many creatures right up to the great white sharks. Is it, it's, it's lacing the ocean together with evidence. There, there are lots of pieces that have been known for a very long time, but what you're doing is bringing it together in a place with stories and images and evidence that really brings it home. And I hope this story about the flow of energy and how this shapes the chemistry of the ocean, carbon capture, oxygen generation, the chemistry of the planet, that there are many stories that you're telling here, but I think this big story of how the ocean really functions with your evidence, visual and with instruments, is really the knockout payload. OK, Sylvia, you could not have said it better. I want to say it uh, once uh, as best I can from a moving ship after a month-long voyage. I know that oceanography right now is focused in a lot of different realms. And what we don't really have going on in a big way is uh, investment that we need in biological ocean observing. So we're able with autonomous vehicles like sail drone with a ship as wonderfully uh, built as the Schmidt Ocean Institute's ship to use echo sounding and acoustics like we've never done before. So between the sail drone and the ship, the survey is extraordinary of how many hours of acoustic data we've acquired. And then by direct observation with eDNA, with the remote operated vehicle, we can confirm what we're seeing. We need to be doing this around the planet now. We need to be finding out where these hotspots are and learning more about what we need to do to protect them. So thank you, Sylvia, for pointing that out. We totally agree with what you've said. A major outcome of the trip is that we can see the trophic cascade that would bring a white shark out to this region. And we can understand part of the oceanographic conditions that are creating this less than desert-like place. Like there isn't the type of stability in the ocean water column that, that you would expect in a desert, there's instead a very lively place in which there's a lot of turnover of water and the capacity to get nutrients to the surface. So we'll let the uh, denizen of the deep make a comment here about this. I agree with Ruby. We need to be there, too, personally. Yeah. <laughs> it's true. I agree that, too. Sylvia, just last night, we were flying through the upper layers of the deep scattering layer. Uh, enumerating the fishes, the crustaceans, the uh, bisonic siphonophores, a whole variety of animals that contribute to that backscatter that, that makes the layers. 
It's not just fishes. It's a oh, whole no. suite of different kinds of animals that, that make up that migrant community that comes up towards the surface at night, back down into deep water during the day, drawing uh, nutrients down with them and being a principal part of the biological pump that, uh, that is the flywheel of, of That's it. ocean carbon flux. All your jellies capturing carbon, taking it. <laughs> That's amazing. Uh, all right, I think we've got time for one more if there's uh, another question. Sure, yeah, up in the back. So the question here is uh, acknowledging the fact that we've got this interconnectedness from around half of the globe. Um, how have sort of changes in communications technology affected the way you've been able to carry out this research over the last, say, decade? Or, yeah. I'll just briefly say the Schmidt Ocean Institute boat may be the, one of the more technologically capable ships on the planet, especially when it came to doing something like sequencing. Uh, our team would not have been able to use a min-ion sequencer on board if we didn't have the computational power to do our gen bank work of uh, examining what did the DNA really match to right on board a computer cluster. We have this incredible capacity to reach shore. And I think that you know we really are in a ship of the modern ages. And so what I love the best about our voyage was the integration of technology. We're traditional oceanographers. We want to use a net. We want to use an ROV. But at the same time, we picked up the cells left behind by animals and used uh, modern oceanography that might allow us to more rapidly in the future, once we do these comparisons between the different, the different outputs from these different technologies and, and, and validate them, allow us to census a national marine sanctuary or census a, a a, a marine protected area quickly and know, you know when we're losing a bluefin or know when we're gaining a cod. And so I believe that with the Aspen High Seas Initiative and other initiatives like this, the call for biological ocean obs observation is strong and the combination of biologging techniques, automated vehicles, eDNA and traditional techniques, we couldn't encourage more investment in these directions at this time. And we sort of wanna thank the folks who made this voyage happen the Schmidt Ocean Institute and others uh, for allowing us to have the privilege of coming out to the cafe. Great. Thanks, Barb. And it's a great place to wrap up. And thank you so much for your time. I, I know you're uh, exhausted after a long journey. It's being at sea has its own, uh, its own challenges to it. So thank you for taking the time here on your, as you turn for home port for, uh, for, for joining us and, and, and taking this, these hours. There are a lot of folks to, to thank for what we've seen here today. First of all, I want to start with obviously the Schmidt uh, Ocean Institution uh, Institute, without whom we w wouldn't be talking to you because you wouldn't be there. Um, obviously, Dr. Knowlton and the Smithsonian for hosting us here today uh, and everything that they do around ocean awareness and conservation. Um, I want to thank our other participants, certainly Sylvia, um, thank you for being here and for all that you do. Fanny, Francesco, uh, thank you for joining uh, remotely and for hanging with us. Um, Thank you to our tech team who has put this all together and allowed us to, uh, to see everybody and hear everybody throughout the course of this incredibly complicated operation. Um, and again, thanks to everybody for being here in the room. Uh, I hope uh, you've been as uh, impressed by everything that we've seen here today as I have. Um, you know, it's, it's great to have folks here, especially the students, the people who are going to be the future of this work. Um, the more that you stay engaged and the more that we can keep driving your work forward, the better we're all going to be uh, all around the planet. So this, uh, we have recorded everything. It will be in our, our YouTube feed going forward. We encourage you to share it uh, as much as possible so that others can pick up on this. Um, and before we wrap up, I just want to hand it quickly back to, to Her Deepness for the final word on our, our operations here. So this is like a window into the high seas that has never been possible before right about now. And we are so privileged to be here, all of us, as a part of the action, if you will. What you've seen today would not have been possible 50 years ago. And 50 years from now, well, if we don't act on what is being learned, we're going to lose the opportunity to make one of the most 
important investments we can make as a civilization in terms of understanding and protecting half the world, as if our lives depend on it, <laughs> because, of course, they do. One little footnote. This area that the team at sea right now has identified as critical, the deep scattering layer, this 100 to 200 meter band of life that isn't continuous around the world, but it is widespread, really important in terms of the chemistry of the ocean and largely neglected, except right now, Asian nations and even European nations are gearing up to tackle this band of life as a source of mushed up, quotes, wild protein to be used as products, not to respect, as Ruby has pointed out, the immense diversity, a cross-section of life. As many as 15 phyla of animals may be found in a bucket full of what comes up from the deep scattering layer, the larval stages of many creatures, plus these other numerous creatures that are unique to the ocean are not found on the land anywhere. Knowing is the key. You can't care if you don't know. And this is a moment as never before when we must dive in. You all come, let's go, onward and downward. Yay for the team. Thank you, everybody. Have a good afternoon. Okay. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Thanks, everyone on the Falcor. You guys were awesome. Thanks, Fanny. Thanks, Francesco. Uh, it was a home run, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Bob, for everything you did to put it together. You're very welcome.